Welcome to On the Middle East, our Monitor's weekly podcast on the big events shaping the region. My name is Amran Zaman, and I'll be looking at Turkey's efforts at normalizing relations with its longtime enemy, Syrian President Bashar al Assad. Assad and Turkey's President Recep Tayyip Erdogan used to be close allies prior to the conflict in Syria, but their friendship soured when Turkey decided to host and arm Sunni rebels seeking to overthrow Syria's strongman. So what has changed? With us here today to discuss these developments is Ibrahim Hamidi, a senior commentator for the prestigious Saudi daily Ashark al Awsad, who was the first journalist to predict that contacts between Syria and Turkey would be elevated to the ministerial level. So welcome to our show, dear Ibrahim. It's so wonderful to have you with us here today. Thank you so much, uh, Ambarin. It's really wonderful to be uh, with you on your show. So listen, Ibrahim, you have really been at the forefront of this story of Turkish-Syrian rapprochement. You had so many scoops about this, saying this is happening, an important meeting is definitely going to take place, and bingo, we uh, had the defense ministers, Syrian and Turkish defense ministers, meet in Moscow. Now Turkish Foreign Minister Çavuşoğlu says that he will be meeting his Syrian counterpart later this month, And uh, the Turkish uh, presidential spokesman and also the spokesman for Erdogan's party has said that the uh, goal is for the two presidents to meet. So can you uh, briefly tell us what kind of progress, if any, has been achieved so far? What is the result of this first meeting between the ministers in Moscow? Uh, uh, thank you so much, uh, Ambarin, once again, to, uh, for having me in this uh, program. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I am Syrian, Syrian journalist. I was based in Damascus, then moved to Beirut. After that, I moved to London. I've been working for 32 years. I always been uh, uh, fascinated uh, and um, interested in the Syrian-Turkish relations. Since I was a kid, uh, uh, born in Idlib, which is northwest of Syria, very close to the Uh, Turkish border. So uh, following the Turkish-Syrian relations is very important, always been important to me as uh, before and as now. Now, where are we standing? Uh, to put everything into perspective, uh, I think we really, it's very important to look at the history of the Syria and the relation between Damascus and Ankara. Always, always, in the last century, always the relations moved from bad to worst or even to golden era era so we the two countries were very close to have a war uh, in 1998 and that was not the first time it was uh, the, the same in the 50s and uh, before and after and then uh, when Bashar Assad came to power and then starting from 2005 the Syrians and the relations actually Assad and Erdogan had a honeymoon They had, and actually I myself accompanied Assad to Ankara when he met with uh, Erdogan, when he was a president. And since then, we moved to the to the better era, which is the, like the, the last 12 years. Can I just jump in there, Ibrahim? You said you were present when you saw Erdogan meet with Assad. Was there a real chemistry there? Did they actually, did these two men actually like each other? I don't know if they liked each other, but definitely, definitely there was, they were very close. I remember, I think in 2009, even they went to the stadium together, even they played almost, they tried to play football together. And even the Syrian Turkish officials, I remember, we walked, uh, we drove uh, down to Gazi Antab, and then we walked together to the Syrian uh, Turkish borders and just to re to open the Syrian Turkish Uh, uh, border gate and to remove uh, as a sign of removing visa requirements between Syria and Turkey. So, uh, was there a chemistry? I guess yes, uh, but 
What I'm sure of is that definitely they had very close ties. And don't forget, Erdogan helped Assad to get out of the cold uh, uh, in 2005 after the uh, the Syrian pulling out from Lebanon and the assassination of the former Lebanese Prime Minister Rafik al-Hariri. So, I mean, you were mentioning the sort of evolution of this relationship and how we reached the bitter phase where these two people became the worst enemies. But um, are we on the cusp of wit witnessing once again Erdogan helping Assad come back out of the cold? Uh, 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 I think so, but there is the new element, I think, which is now you have Putin involved. The Russian uh, president, Vladimir Putin, is involved in this. And he's, 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 even if there is no chemistry, even if they, Assad and Erdogan had this bitter, bitter uh, history in the last 12 years, now Putin is pushing, pushing very hard the two uh, uh, leaders, Assad and Erdogan, to meet together, hoping that meeting between Assad and Erdogan will help Erdogan to be uh, re-elected in the presidential election middle of next year. So you think that's the main reason? Because after all, let's not forget that if this is about electoral calculations for Erdogan, uh, a meeting between Erdogan and Assad, in the at least in the Kurdish world, will conjure images, uh, recollections of how these two men cooperated against the Kurds for long years. Here is what I think. Here is what I hear, actually, as a journalist, speaking to uh, sources from different parties. What I'm hearing from my sources is that the way uh, the Putin is uh, uh, understands what's happening is that, okay, Russia, after the, the Ukraine war, is in need for Turkey. The relations uh, between uh, Putin and Erdogan is not like friendly relations. It's always uh, they have this hostile cooperation relation in different theaters, in Libya, uh, Armenia, Azerbaijan, in Syria, and in Ukraine. And uh, yes, for Putin, he finds it very difficult to make deals with, er with Erdogan. But actually, for Putin, he would like to cooperate with this leader, with Erdogan, for many reasons that I mentioned. And in addition to that, he's in a way, Erdogan is helping Putin in a way to try to dismantle or to weaken the NATO front. And they have this bilateral uh, relations and, and commercial, commercially, security, uh, economy, everything. So for all reasons, for Erdogan, Putin wants, is willing, and he wants Erdogan to be re-elected. Now, the Russian understanding is that there are two sticking issues in the elections. We have the refugees question and the Kurdish question. When it comes to the refugees question, I mean, the Syrian refugees issue is the most um, uh, important. We are talking about 4 million Syrian refugees in Turkey. And that has been a, a top issue in the Turkish debate and the uh, Turkish opposition. They are putting this high on the agenda. So for 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 for, 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 for the Putin to help Erdogan, they, he believed that, okay, the best way is, is to present Erdogan as someone who is trying to solve this issue. He's willing to meet even with Assad to address the refugees issue. Now, the second issue which is you, you tackled is the Kurdish issue. This is much more complicated, more complex, uh, more, uh, I mean, it's, uh, uh, as you said, they have different levels, different dimensions. One of them is ex existential for the Turkish uh, state, for Turkey. And as you said, the Kurds are very important voters in their upcoming elections. Now, what Putin is trying to say, uh, to do, is like, okay, let's let Assad and Erdogan meet and to work collectively together to, dis to dismantle this Kurdish entity, which was established northeast of Syria. So uh, then Erdogan will try to present himself to the Turkish voters. Look, I am, I was willing even to meet to and talk with my enemy, Assad, to try to address this existential, this like this big issue, which is the Kurdish state, hoping that he will address 
the right wing Turkish voters. Okay, so are you Republican. basically saying that he knows that the Kurds are not going to vote with for him anyway? So, you know, let's just go and invest all our um, cards in the nationalist voter base. That is that is the perception. This is what I'm hearing. This is what I'm hearing. I think this is this is what is what, what the driver behind. The Russian thinking. Okay, so why would Assad want to help his enemy? Is he doing this only because Russia is forcing him to? You know, this is a very important question. As you know, the only country who is giving support for the Syrian opposition is Turkey. So for Assad, like if he is able to pull Turkey away from supporting the Syrian the Syrian opposition, that's a big thing. Big thing. This is a B, I mean, uh, now it seems that recently uh, uh, he's uh, he's uh, he's more concerned uh, 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 about the Kurdish, uh, about the American support to the to the Kurds, and he is willing to use uh, Turkey to make more pressure on the Kurds. But still, but but to honest, still, we oh, what I heard, and I'm sure you heard the same from your own sources that. Uh, even after Putin, Putin pushed very hard, as, uh, pushed Assad very hard to meet with the Erdogan, and Assad uh, was very uh, hesitant, hesitant to do it. He he said, "No, I, look, I I cannot really do it unless there is at least public statement from the Turks saying that uh, uh, they will pull out from Syria." Because as we know, as we know, it is very embarrassing for the Syrian government that you have almost the uh, uh, almost the size of the double size of Lebanon being occupied by Turkey north of Syria. So it's very difficult and embarrassing for Assad to meet with Erdogan. So he was insisting to have public statement from Erdogan that he's willing to pull out before they meet. And until now, we did not hear that. So and then Putin road came and he made a lot of pressure on Assad to 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 start uh, uh, this uh, implementing this roadmap, uh, which will end by meeting between uh, Erdogan and, and Assad. So what kind of results have we had so far? Uh, the defense ministers meet, met. Um, you had an article describing the outcome. Could you just tell our um, audience what that outcome was? Between the two ministers of defense or the... Yes. You know, it is... Um, it is... Uh, uh, I think we should go back a little bit. I think, I, I think we should go back a little bit to January 2020. Uh, at that time, the Russians, once again, the Russians pushed Assad, Putin pushed Assad and Erdogan to start this normalization process. And the head of the security, the Syrian security and the Turkish security met in Moscow. And I was briefed about this meeting from different sources. And actually, at that point, at that point, like we're talking about three years ago, that the Syrians, uh, what they were, what they wanted by, by then, they wanted from Turkey two things. One is to work with Russia to reopen the highway between west of Syria and east of Syria. And the second wanted Turkey to pull out from big cities in north of uh, Syria. And Turkey refused to do any of these two steps. And that's why this, this the, the normalization process, which was kicked off in January 2020, was frozen. Now, as we know, now we have different elements. We have the Ukraine war more hostile cooperation between Putin and Erdogan. We have the, the uh, Turkish elections approaching soon. And four, we have another element, which is like we the Syrian crisis, the Syrian economic crisis is becoming even more and more. And on top of all of that, now it's very clear that the, the Americans are staying in north north, 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 north east of Syria. In 2019, with the Trump, as you know, Trump pulled out from part of Syria, and that opened the gate the gate for Turkey to invade north of Syria. Now, with Biden, it's very clear. Now, the Americans are there to stay at least until the end of Biden Biden's term. At no, least that that's pretty clear. Yeah. But you know, you mentioned these elements uh, that Turkey refused to yield on, but it now seems that on the M four. There may be movement. That's what I'm hearing from my sources. And we heard the Turkish defense minister yesterday talk about resuming the joint patrols in northern Syria, in Idlib. 
So there could be movement there. And at the same Absolutely. time, I think there's certainly an effort on the part of Turkey to somehow get uh, the Russians, whether directly or indirectly, to engage with HTS, with Hayat Tahrir al-Sham. Yes, very good points. So now, yes, now, yes, and what, what, what we all are hearing, there is a roadmap. Roadmap is like, as you said, look, first security meetings, then uh, uh, meetings between the two ministers of defense, after that, maybe middle of this month, there will be meeting between, between the two foreign ministers, the Syrian and the Turkish counterpart, and then later, uh, meeting between Assad and Erdogan. To reach there, to reach that uh, end game, which is Assad Erdogan meeting before the election, is there are a lot of steps need to be taken. One of them, as you mentioned, one of them is that the Syrian uh, government, the Syrian regime, they are insisting at least we need some concrete steps. One of them is to open A4. Uh, M4, M4 between Latakia and uh, uh, Aleppo, and then further down to the northeast of Syria. And as you said, uh, uh, how you do it? You do it by by resuming uh, joint patrols between the Russians and the Turks, uh, and by maybe a sort of engagement between the Russians and HTS, Hayat Tahrisham, which is controls northwest of Syria, northwest of Syria. And so there will be a accumulation of steps, concrete steps to reach uh, the Assad at the meeting. And it seems to me, uh, you know, even though all these countries, the United States and um, the United Nations, Turkey itself, and of course the Russians, the regime designate HTS as a terrorist organization, the fact remains that it is the most coherent, the most powerful group uh, among all those uh, Sunni opposition rebels in, in Northern Syria. And obviously, if there's going to be some kind of accommodation between Turkey and the regime, you, you can't have a situation where this results in millions of more Syrian refugees pouring into Turkey. That's the last thing that Turkey wants. So in that respect, too, of course, HTS becomes a rather critical player because it is in a position, at least that's obviously what Turkey hopes and calculates to possibly stop that from happening. So it's an, actually we're at a very interesting, uh, I think, juncture in, 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 in this whole conflict mess that is Syria. So what are you hearing from your Syrian Kurdish sources? Because I know you have excellent access to all of those sources. And you, in fact, even met Abdullah Öcalan back in the day. Yes. Yes, actually, yes, you're right. I met I met Abdullah Ojlan, the leader of PKK, uh, Abdullah Ojlan, you know, Apo. I met him maybe five, seven times in the middle of 90s, back, I mean, in Damascus, before before he was asked to leave Syria, October 1998. Uh, um, yes, I mean, I I mean, I spoke to my, uh, some, I spoke to some Kurdish leaders in the last few days. I spoke to some Western officials in the last few days. And I spoke to, to some, uh, Turkey, uh, uh, Syrian opposition leaders in northwest of Syria in the last few days. What, what is for me? What's interesting? I, once again, as a journalist, what is interesting is that, and I'm sure I don't know if you noticed this. Two years ago, if you spoke to any Syrian, any source based in Damascus or close to the government, or if you spoke to any Russian official, always they they used to tell you, look, you know, Idlib is next. We will go back to Idlib. Hey, Tahrir Sham, HTS is a terrorist organization, and we will liberate, quote-unquote, Idlib uh, very soon. The whole focus in the Syrian official narrative was Idlib in the last few years. I think the shift started gradually after the Ukraine war. If you remember, after just before Turkey, before Russia started you, uh, the uh, war in Ukraine, 24th of February, the Russian Minister of Defense came to Damascus to 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 uh, the Russian military base in uh, Latakia, and uh, and he met with Assad. At that time, at that time, that's I think for at that time the Syrians uh, official officials were preparing the ground for a military operation in Idlib. 
And the Russians, what I heard, Shwego told the Syrian officials, look, you know, forget about Idlib. Because we are not here to upset Turkey. No. Gradually, the Syrian merit, uh, discourse started to shift from considering HDS as the main enemy to consider SDF as the main enemy. The Kurds SDF as, the, as in the Syrian Democratic Forces, the forces partner, the Kurdish-led partner in northeast Syria. Yes. 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 Very important shift. The, the, that's the, where Turkey and Assad exactly. fight. Now, now, now when, when I speak to some sources in Russia, like in Moscow or in Damascus, well-informed sources, now they tell you actually the main enemy for us is SDF slash YPG slash PKK. So are your Kurdish sources nervous about what's happening? They are very much nervous. Mm -hmm. They are very much nervous, to be honest. They are worried and nervous about this shift and there were some there were some talks, secret talks between a delegation from northeast of Syria and with the Syrian officials in Damascus, like almost two months, like a few weeks ago. And even now the Syrian officials in this in these meetings actually they retracted some concessions they gave before. So even they they, they became even tougher on the Kurds. Trust me, what I'm hearing is in terms of narrative in Damascus now, they believe SDF slash YPG PKG is, quote unquote, they are agents to the Americans, they are perpetrators, they are, uh, they, we, they are the main enemies, they are more dangerous than HTS, Hayat Tahrir Sham and Northwest of Syria. Northwest of Syria. That is, here is where the Syrian re of regime, the Turkish government, interest meet. Now they they have common goal, they have mutual interest, is look, this is our uh, enemy. This is, uh, the, the those guys are the agents of the Americans. So you have Moscow, Ankara, and uh, Damascus, and in a way, Tehran as well. They have all of them unified on one goal. So now that they're united against the Kurds, and there's tremendous pressure on the Kurds basically to capitulate and to sever ties with the United States. That's the game plan here. But of course, the Kurds will not do that for as long as the Americans are ready to stay in uh, Northeast Syria, and they are, at least until the end of the term of this current administration. Um, the Kurds believe that you know that's the leverage they have at hand when they talk to Damascus, when they, you know, try and forge some kind of deal. But as you said, Damascus has become even tougher. So where does that leave the Kurds? And where does that leave the Americans when you have Turkey now joining the chorus, which it wasn't previously, saying America has to leave? And it's interesting, guys. One Kurdish official gave me a very nice quote. I told him, what are you betting on? He said, we're betting on... Uh, Erdogan, Erdogan is leaving and the Americans are staying. So they are betting that the Americans to stay in the office of Syria and Erdogan to lose the election. But but uh, I think uh, there is a new interesting element. I, I'm sure you know where the American, uh, official, the American government, where they stand. They said it publicly that they are against the normalization between Ankara and Damascus. It was I a think, weak statement, though. It was still, very strong. Yeah, but it, 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 you know, it was a weak statement. But but mind you, let's uh, let's not forget, they were the only Western government who announced official statement on this. All the other European, all the other Western European countries said nothing, said nothing. Even a weak statement was not released. This is a. B, we know that. For the Americans, for Biden, if they have something positive after the withdrawal, the humiliating withdrawal from Afghanistan, is their 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 success to defeat ISIS, and definitely they do not want to see the uh, 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 rebirth of ISIS again. So this is so that the Kurds are betting on that the fact that the Kurds. The Americans want to keep the pressure on ISIS, so they're not going to let them alone. And the Kurds made it very clear to the Americans, look, 
if we are attacked by the Kurds, by the by the by Turks, the Syrian government, the Russian, we will stop our cooperation against ISIS, and we will fight against the Turks, and then ISIS might rebirth uh, rebirth again. Now here, what is what I'm hearing again? I just spoke to Western official yesterday, and he told me, and I think these are correct. Now the Americans are taking a new approach. Now I think there is. There is, uh, there will be an American official visiting Turkey soon, the upcoming uh, few days, I think, and to mediate between the Kurds and Ankara. So the, the Americans are trying to mediate to say, look, you know, what do you want? I mean, they are asking the Turks, and I'm sure you know that the sticking, at least in terms of narrative, the sticking point between Ankara and the Kurds is one thing. The Turks are saying we want to establish this buffer zone. 30k deep in North Syria between the Turkish borders and the uh, North Syria, and uh, we want it to be uh, y PKK YPG free area, and the, the 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 Turks say the Kurds saying look you know we pulled out there's no PKK there's no YPG in this area since 2019, but what we have there we have policemen Asayish and we have local councils, and the, the Turks are saying look. You have to dismantle everything, local councils and such. We don't accept any kind of Turkish presence in this buffer zone. And I think this is where, where the American mediation is coming. So the Americans are coming to try to find solution to, uh, to, to address the Turkish concerns without, without military operation north of Syria. Well, I'm highly skeptical that they will get anywhere with that effort, to be honest, because Erdogan is fully on the warpath. They're not interested anymore because for them, it's been tried and tested since Mambij when uh, the United States helped the Kurds, you know, oust ISIS from Mambij and they pledged that uh, the YPG would then withdraw and they never really did. And so as far as Turkey is concerned, the Americans don't keep their promises on this. And they're, they're really not interested in talking to the SDF or making deals with the SDF. We're beyond that. We're past that. So good luck to the American official, whoever he or she may be. But I want to ask I, you I now, agree. I, by the way, I agree with you. I agree with you. I cannot uh, disagree with you. So, uh, Ibrahim, I want to ask you about the other players, you know, the Saudis. We we already see the UAE. The minister was just, again, meeting with Assad in Damascus and lots of sort of flowery, you know, words were exchanged and, you know, love is in the air. And uh, we already, Kuwait, Oman, all these countries, the, the outliers, the main, the outliers are still Egypt and Saudi Arabia. And as you mentioned in your own reporting, we have this Arab League summit coming up. And again, this will be a test of whether, you know, Assad is, on, uh, you know, going to be reintegrated, welcomed back into the fold or not. What are you hearing from your sources? We know that Egypt obviously needs to sort of pay attention to what the Americans tell them because the Americans give them lots and lots of money that allows their economy to, you know, uh, survive. So obviously, if the Americans say, no, you can't do this, they won't, and we know the Americans are saying that to them. But what about the Saudis? You know, the, it's interesting. You know, the, the visit of the United Arab Emirates Foreign Minister, Abdullah bin Zayed, yesterday uh, to Damascus and his meeting with Assad, that timing was very interesting and important. It just came one day after the Americans made public statements saying, look, you know, we encourage all, all countries not to normalize with Assad. So that was interesting, to be honest, that he just, in a way, it seems that some Arab countries do not really listen to the Americans. Second, is this meeting, this visit to uh, Damascus, of course, the Emirati foreign minister already, he visited Damascus before, November 2021, and uh, the president of United Emirates already received Assad middle of last year. So, I mean, there, there is normalization between Damascus and Abu Dhabi already. But the timing is interesting that it came just, this visit came after a few days of uh, the Syrian Turkish meetings and just a few weeks maybe before Assad Erdogan meeting. For me, I think the message, the message is that um, 
and I think Assad will try to use this. I, I mean, we, we, like some Arab countries believe, okay, we have to keep, to keep the door open to Damascus. We don't want Damascus being hijacked, quote unquote, by Tehran or Ankara. If if the if like we should not let uh, leave Syria alone or Damascus alone to have this quote unquote strategic alliance with uh, Iran or to revive its alliance with the Turkey, where well, the Arabs should go back to Damascus. And I think Assad Assad will try to use this. He's trying to use to 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 use the talk about normalization with Turkey and the talk about uh, this strategic relation with Iran to encourage the Arabs to give more concessions, to be more, more uh, 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 flexible to, 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 for normalization with Damascus. Well, one of the cards Turkey is obviously playing is uh, saying that, you know, if we reconcile with the Assad regime, that will help diminish Iran's influence. I'm sure that's what Turkish diplomats must be telling their American and Israeli uh, counterparts and uh, probably the Saudis as well. I don't know. But at the end of the day, of course, it's it's quite tragic, isn't it, that this man who is responsible for the deaths of hundreds of thousands of his own citizens in the most horrible fashion is apparently being allowed to carry on. Um, and that the Kurds who fought so bravely, valiantly against the Islamic State are also... Um, being abandoned. You you mentioned that the Europeans haven't said anything. Uh, and of course, now with the Ukraine conflict and the application of these Nordic countries for NATO membership, the fact that Turkey plays a critical role in allowing grain supplies to reach the rest of the world, all of this, of course, has uh, changed the calculus for many of these countries. And, uh, you know, Ironically, of course, you said the Kurds are hoping that uh, the Americans will stay and the opposition will come or that Erdogan will go in Turkey. Uh, the truth is that if the opposition wins by some miracle, that can only accelerate America's own plans, perhaps to, you know, end this alliance with the Kurds, because the Americans, too, want to reset their relationship with this extremely important NATO ally. Uh, and a fresh start with an opposition that uh, is, you know, more Western friendly, of course, <laughs> that's not great for the Kurds either. So, yeah, so many imponderables, my dear, dear friend. We will continue to read you with great, great interest. Thank you, Thank so, you much. so much. Thank you, for being Thank on you my dear. Program. Thank you, my dear. It's, it's, I'm, I'm thrilled. It's my honor to be with you and your program, really. And well, it's our honor. Thank you very much, Ibrahim, and Thank all you. our love to your amazing wife, Dima Wamus. Thank you. Thank you, Habibi. Thank you so much. And this brings us to the end of this week's On the Middle East. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Ibrahim as much as I did. It was rather longer this time, but I really think it was worth every minute that I spent with him. Thank you and goodbye.